While Raph may have suggested to me in passing one day to download this iOS release way back, it was my non-gamer cousin who pushed me to install it after he described the unique level design. The initial 10 level pack produced by us two is stylistically distinct. It features text art and Escher-esque level design that plays with depth and perception to create puzzles that are mostly satisfying to solve. I'm impressed by the look of the game, but in the end, feel like the puzzles in the first release are largely too simple in solution. More recently, however, the second level pack came out and completely changed my position on the game. Monument Valley The Forgotten Shores expands on the puzzles in much more compelling ways while maintaining the same beautiful aesthetic. Monument Valley is 10 on my list this year for its look, design, and ability to assign real characterization and personality to a stack of cubes. Coming in at number 9 is my favorite 3DS title of the year, Bravely Default. While I love the JRPG genre, I'll be the first to criticize their flaws. The endless grind, hours of inventory management, and paragraphs of text you would rather button through at times while watching Netflix. Now I'm here to tell you that Bravely Default has all of that good stuff, but also allows players to tailor their experience to decide how much grinding they want to do at any given time. Players can turn encounter rates up when leveling, down when exploring new areas, or off when backtracking. Don't like where this story arc is headed? Don't worry about it. With Bravely Default's brilliant one-handed mode, you can play while doing other things. That being said, Bravely Default also happens to have interesting characters and a passable saving the world story. Some of the dungeons and level design is on par with the Tales series, and overall was an incredibly enjoyable handheld experience that was always as grindy or as passive as I wanted it to be at any given moment throughout its enormous 50 hour campaign. Much to Raph's constant disappointment, I can never bring myself to play through the entirety of The Walking Dead. When I heard that Telltale was making a new adventure game, I decided I'd at least try it out despite my inability to finish their last series. The Wolf Among Us is a gripping story that once again presents interesting characters and dialogue choices, ultimately leading up to a somewhat tailored, choose-your-own-adventure ending. Despite its bizarre antagonist switcheroo halfway through the story, the series is a great adaptation of the fable story, and portrays the dark side of everyone's favorite grim bedtime stories. Shadow of Mortar is the best licensed game that I've played in a very long time. This open world game borrows Arkham's combat system and an Assassin's Creed style stealth system, and brings them together in one incredibly well-polished universe. What sets Shadow of Mortar apart from all other games of this genre is its new nemesis system. And while not terribly easy to describe in so few words, the nemesis system is an enemy hierarchy system where orcs have unique names and traits. Any time an event is resolved in the open world, whether by your own direct influence, or by the orcs resolving it amongst themselves, the hierarchy shifts and the orcs level up, they get promoted, or demoted, or killed, depending on the outcome. All of this results in an incredible open world experience that not only feels unique and alive, but also reflects the changes made by the player. In addition to this dynamic gameplay system, the orcs have some hilarious dialogue. You know what happens when I hit things? They break! And can often stumble into the open world in the worst possible situations. For example, if I were hunting a certain orc and taking out guards and gathering intel, I would feel safe to engage the orc captain, but lo and behold, every single time, a bounty hunter pops in and utters a one-liner right before ruining my day. There isn't always cause for abandoning your target and fleeing in such an occasion, but another thing I absolutely love about this game is how it penalizes you for dying to an orc if you misjudge the situation and decide not to run. Any orc that can bring down the protagonist gets a hefty level increase in promotion that will make them a bigger threat in future encounters. Overall, while a single new mechanic doesn't always make a game good, Middle Earth is a refined package of old and new that turned out to be one of the best of the year. Jazzpunk is one of those games that initially looked unappealing to me, but found its way onto my Play Before Game of the Year debate list. When assembling a list of the best games of the year, it's hard not to recognize the ones that made you laugh hysterically or sob long into the night. While a little weak on the latter, Jazzpunk had gags that ranged consistently from I have company over giggles to I'm not wearing any pants anyways, who cares, thunderous laughter. It's so rare that a game is so ridiculous and funny that the laughter persists throughout the entire story. Now Jazzpunk isn't a commentary on society, it doesn't examine important themes or even really look particularly impressive, but I'll be damned if it doesn't deserve its number 6 spot on my list for the pure happiness it generated as I played it. Now that I really think about it, I'm not sure why Destiny is so high on my list of games this year. The campaign is short, lacks any sort of real, compelling story, the PvP is devoid of any sort of progression, and the material grinding system at endgame is borderline offensive. 
But buried in a sea of problems, Destiny still retains a reasonably high spot on my list for its magical ability to keep me playing until I had two level 30 characters. I may never have played a game with such engaging and tight fundamental shooting. Destiny is best played as a cooperative experience, despite Bungie's lack of social implementation. And the fact that I played over 100 hours of this game with a buddy of mine truly speaks to its great co-op gameplay. While the mission content itself gets stale, I didn't mind doing the same defense missions week after week with my friends listening to Destiny's outstanding musical score. Lastly, Destiny has a single raid at the time of this writing and it is incredible. I've cleared the raid well over a dozen times and I'm still looking forward to clearing it again. With the framework for the IP laid, and recognizing that Bungie can create tremendously entertaining raid mechanics, it goes without saying that I am excited for what a more polished sequel will bring. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter is another game that took me by surprise this year. Having heard about it from Olivier, I played it because I fondly recall playing Dear Esther so long ago. Without giving away too much, the story revolves around a little boy and his family who live on a secluded island. His adventuring about one day triggers the start of something that the Carter family will not soon forget. The first thing I noticed about this game is just how incredible it looks. Honestly, I could hardly believe that a small team could design such a game that looks so real. The island's environments are varied enough that each one could be an actual place. Finding out that the island is in fact modeled after a real place doesn't make the world any less impressive. It's translated into the game with impeccable care. The Vanishing of Ethan Carter is so high up on my list mostly for its outstanding environment and its imperfect but compelling plot. My most surprising pick of the year, Bioware's latest entry into the franchise changes my position on the series. Instead of having to grit my teeth and bear with the tactical combat system I abhorred in order to enjoy the dialogue and high fantasy questing, Inquisition allows for a much faster combat action if that's how you wish to play, and I do. The story and world are enormous, and I can't help but be suckered into the detail, collectible rich environments. I could write forever about the Inquisitor I've designed and the choices that I've regretted, but suffice to say that my number 3 game this year is an excellent blend of role-playing fantasy and open world exploration, and if nothing else, I'm sure it will keep me busy long into the new year. Transistor is a really special game for me this year. And like Supergiant Games Bastion before it, Transistor is a masterpiece of colors and sounds, and they come together to tell a really great story. The gameplay doesn't always flow perfectly with the plot, but is nonetheless entertaining, although I would have preferably gone with a true turn-based system. By bringing back the difficulty modifiers and including a new game plus mode, the game has a reasonable sense of replayability, and by the end I was ready to go at it all over again to see the game's gorgeous imagery and metaphor through new eyes. I'm still not sure that I will replay Transistor to the extent that I did Bastion, but I do very much look forward to what Supergiant Games to produce in the future with their excellent game design choices and persistent disembodied narrator. Contrary to most war games in recent memory, Valiant Hearts focuses on the lives of a handful of people and their struggles instead of the combat itself. The game is a collection of stories and illustrates the terrors of war and its impact on the population without overtly spelling it out. The gameplay is also a pretty excellent blend of puzzles and adventure that somehow manages to make history into an engaging and relevant collectible. There are many games I've played that have made me emotional, a list far shorter than Raph's I assure you, but far fewer still earn every tier so well. These scenes are juxtaposed brilliantly by moments of ecstasy and excitement. Now I don't want to spoil any part of this brilliant tale, so I'll end by simply urging you to play through it at some point as its finale is not to be missed. I'm Andrew Kuto. Those are my top 10 games of 2014. Thanks for listening.